Hello, I'm Tom Butcher at the Hello, Zero the Zero Project Conference in Vienna, and I'm joined um, virtually today by Michael Johnson. Michael, where am I speaking to you at, as they say? <laughs> I'm in southern Wisconsin, here in the central United States. Excellent. So I presume it's fairly chilly there. It is about, I'd say, minus 10 C. Hey, it's a wee bit warmer here. And on that note, I am going to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about Benetech, but also about your place in Benetech. And then what we're going to do is chat about the GCA publish, uh, Publisher Certification Program. So if you could tell us a little bit more about Benetech and yourself, that would be great. Right. So Benetech is a charity. We're a nonprofit, 21 years old. We are a technology company which is focused on using technology for the social good. Our largest program is about getting digital content fully accessible to people with print disabilities. Because once a book is digital, that doesn't necessarily make it accessible. So that's our largest project. We have 900,000 users in about 80 countries around the world, operating in 60 odd languages. So that's our biggest program, a million titles in our database. Uh, if a member has a certified print disability, they have access to that content. Um, wow. So that's Benetech, Benetech in a broad stroke, 21 years and all that. My role is director of content partnerships. So while I assist in that project I just mentioned, my main remit is to run our global certified accessible program, which is a program where we work with the publishing community and the publishing services community to teach those organizations how to create fully accessible digital content from the jump. So in their normal production flow, you'll be able to create fully accessible digital content. Great, thank you so much. So to, to go back to real basics, um, why did you create the program in the first place? Excellent question. So in the 21 years we've been gathering content from a thousand publishers around the world, we've learned several things, but one of the key takeaways was the publishers who want to do well and do better with their accessibility simply didn't have an idea of where to start. Right. What were the standards? <clears throat> what were the best practices? And how could they go about including those in their workflow? So we built the Global Certified Accessible Program to teach the publishing community and the publishing services conversion community how to do it properly. Great, thanks so much. Now, I know that you also have your um, Bookshare program. How does the, uh, what, or what's the difference between the GCA program and the Bookshare program? Right, so Bookshare is a collection of accessible content. Yep. A million titles have been donated. And uh, so we hold that repository and we make those books available to our registered members. GCA is a services program which works with the publishers to teach them how to do things properly. So we don't hold any content. We just go through the assessment and instructional process and then leave the publishers to their regular publisher creation flow. Another piece is GCA is focused entirely on the data format EPUB, which is the most accessible digital format. And Bookshare takes five different formats into account based on the print, the specific print disability for our member. So we would have a digital braille as an example, as one of our output formats. Right. Um, and um, immediate question for me, I'm, as I said, I'm New York, I'm not actually not, was New York based, but I'm now um, a Cleveland based man. Um, is this a New York, US only project or is it international? So uh, both programs are international, G GCA in particular. Uh, we're working with, I'm going to say, clients in eight or nine different countries across three continents. Right. So it, it's uh, really, really uh, taking on an international flavor. And the reason is the standards themselves are international. That's number one. And the second is uh, print disability is an international issue. People all over the world are blind or dyslexic or have low vision or other physical or nervous system challenges, which prevent them from being able to operate a traditional print book. So the standards are international, the yeah. publishing community is international, and the need for accessibility is international. 
Right, and and looking looking at cert the certification, how ma how many people have um, actually received certification? So we've got uh, well, we just had a new one overnight actually. So we've got twenty three organizations around the world that have been fully certified, and then there's another probably forty or so that are in various stages of the certification process. Right, and look at looking at the certification process. It, it, if they're if they're essentially doing it already, is it um, is it even more onerous to get the certification? Um, do they have to do things extra, or if they're if they're really kind of cutting edge, are they going to get their certification anyway? Right, so that depends on where the publisher is as it relates to the international standards. We find uh, the whole gamut of people join the program and they haven't any idea about accessibility. Right. And people join the program and they're well, and they're well on their way. So it really, that's an individual uh, publishing house by publishing house answer. But we have had several who have gone through quickly. Yeah. And we have others who have taken quite some time. Right, and, and is that um, a necessarily a reflection of size or is it a reflection of innovation or um, technological ability I really I really just don't have any idea I think the number one determining factor would be awareness so inside the publishing house what is their level of awareness that accessibility is an issue right. and what are the particular markup elements that need to go into an accessible file so we have huge corporations that uh, are trying but haven't got it sorted and we have small independent presses who are adamant about inclusion and accessibility and diversity and 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 they go through quite quickly so it really it depends on the awareness inside the publishing house especially in the production area right for these issues right thanks so much and um to bring it back to uh, um a kind of as it were a locational focus um i'm here in vienna uh, what kind of impact will the European Accessibility ha Act have on GCA? Right, so we're seeing a significant uptick with the European Accessibility Act. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but the, <laughs> the basic interpretation is from, tw from 2025, it will, will be illegal in the EU to sell or distribute digital goods and services that are not accessible. So that includes software platforms as well as digital content. So we've seen firms uh, from the UK and the EU, uh, say Elsevier as an example, who have jumped in straight away. We have, we're, have a large number of conversations going on in Ireland at present. We have a project going on in Finland. So this legislation from the EU is clearly triggered a higher level of awareness, as I said earlier, and, and that's making a difference. Oh, so very advantageous. Yes, <laughs> it's, um, it's good for the it's good for the readers. Yeah, hey, that's that's all it's about. That's the the most important thing it's about. Um, two more questions. One, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, don't worry, not badly. Um, I'm going to say, what would your call to action be to publishers out there? Right, so the simplest thing would be just to reach out to me, Michael J at Benetech.org, but also there are resources available from uh, a number of organizations. Benetech is one, certainly. The DAISY Consortia is another yeah. great resource. So the, the first thing is to gain an understanding that accessibility is an issue and to assess where your publishing house is. And uh, reach out to us, we offer all sorts of advice. Great, oh, and, and another thought I've had just, um, which might be in, well, I'm certainly interested in it. Um, what, if any, innovations do you see um, on the horizon in the industry which will help you and help readers? Um, I, I don't know if there are any, but have you got, is there a kind of twinkling in your eye where you can see, wow, yeah, I think that, innovation might be really useful. I'm going to keep an eye on that. Or I really must get an interested party and chat with her because what they're doing there could be really helpful. Anything like that that you can tell us about? Or maybe you can't tell us about? 
<laughs> yeah, sure. I, I can tell you the, the, the two biggest the two biggest issues are uh, getting with a publisher's workflow, typically InDesign. So getting from oh, InDesign yeah. to a format which is accessible. So some some sort of conversion that can allow a publisher to stick in its existing workflow using the Adobe suite and then go from InDesign to a workable, accessible file. It's currently not possible, but that that's one big break we're hoping for. And then another one is around images. If you imagine the, the audience we're talking about, many of whom are blind, images are problematic. Yeah. Uh, even for people with even for people with dyslexia, images can be problematic if they are tables or charts. And color blindness comes in when it comes to pie charts and things like that. So, the ability uh, the ability for machine intelligence to recognize an image and, and describe it that's a big leap forward, which we're already seeing. The challenge comes in accessibility is there's another layer, which is just describing the Eiffel Tower is lovely, mm -hmm. but why is the Eiffel Tower in this book? If it's a travel book, the Eiffel Tower is there for reason A. Yeah. If it's an engineering book, the, it's there for reason B. So the understanding, not just what the image is, but how it relates to the context, that's the next, another big innovation we're hoping for and talking to anyone who will listen. Yeah. Yes, because that, that, that um, practically becomes philosophical in, in what kind of metadata or what kind of meta knowledge and how you convey that meta knowledge. Um, I mean, it's the first time I've, I've, I've thought about it in that way, but how on earth you deal with that, I have no idea. But there are so many cleverer people than I am, I'm sure. Um, have you seen any, any, any in, for you, really interesting ways that people are addressing that and that you kind of sets you back thinking, wow, I'd never, wow, I'd never thought about that. Right. Um, so the answer there is very 19th century, not very 21st <laughs> century. And that is uh, the smarter publishing houses are going back to their authors and they're saying, right, you chose to have this picture in here to help you make your point. So you write in why the picture is there. So it, it goes back to a manuscript creation standpoint. You wouldn't allow an author to send you the chapter of a book saying uh, economic development in B Bolivia and then have there be no content in that chapter because that would be irresponsible. You just have a, he a chapter heading with no content. So if you have a picture with no description, it's the same level of responsibility for the author. So that very 19th century innovation, if you will, which is a change in workflow, going back to the person who selected the picture in the first place and said, right, you put it there, you know your reason, just type it in, please. Yeah, That's a, a workflow innovation, not a technology innovation, Great. but it's making a big difference. Well, maybe not an innovation, just going back to basics, because I, I, I have to deal with a lot of people's presentations and I have exactly that thing. And you can say, why on earth is there a picture of a giraffe there? Oh, well, you know, well, why not say it? Yeah. Anyway, on that note, Michael, thanks so much indeed for joining us. I think what you're doing is absolutely fascinating. Please, everybody, either get in touch with Michael or look on the Benetech website and um, wear your woolies when you go out if it's going to be minus 10, Michael. <laughs> but thanks. Oh, we'll be fine. Please. Thank you for the opportunity for the chat. Well, the thanks are from me to you. Thanks so much. Yes, thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye.